Well, welcome to Family Church. It's Will and Paul again, and we are here excited to do a church with you wherever you are. We're here. You're there. Let's get started. We are in the middle of a sermon series called Living, where we are looking at the second half of the book of Ephesians. Earlier this year, we looked at the first half where we really looked at this relationship that we have with God. And over this sermon series and looking at living, this is how do we live it out in relationship to everyone else. So I want you to turn to chapter six in Ephesians, and we're going to be starting in verse one. So we said it last week. Let me say it again this week. Last week, we said marriage is hard. This week, I want to say parenting is difficult. It's hard, and yet it's extremely valuable. In fact, I think it's one of the places where God has incredible opportunity to do transforming in the parents. And we have an incredible opportunity to pour into our children. And children are a gift to the family. They're a gift to the church family. And so we can have an eternal influence if we are doing it in the way that God tells us to do it. So this is more than just how to get through This is really how to make a world changer, a world changing difference. That is easy for you to say. You don't have kids (laughs) at home. You're like, it's more than getting through. It sure doesn't feel like that sometimes. And and it's good to remember, Will and I are at different stages of parenting. You know, he's got kids that are in elementary school and I've got kids that are having kids. And so we want to talk about the fact that all roles are ultimately temporary. Um, It's easy to feel so caught in that moment and, and even last week when we were talking to, to, about marriage, it's easy for singles to say, well, this isn't about me. Well, at some point you may be married. And for those who are married, you may lose a spouse. And so you, you may be single again. So some of you are parenting and you're in the active phase of it. And we want to try to give you some encouragement and help and just focus your thinking on that. And yet kids don't stay kids forever. Right. They become adults. And that is the goal. Yeah. <laughs> well, if they're still living in your basement when they're 40, we should have heard, had this sermon a while ago. <laughs> That's right. And, and hopefully a lot of them become parents, which is when you start to understand your own parents. And I'm in the wonderful place of being able to be a grandparent. And, and, and to look at that 30,000 view, uh, 30,000 foot view, somebody said to me, and I thought this is so true. You would parent differently if you realized you were raising the people that would be parenting your grandchildren because somehow that multi-generational you see so much differently. And as a grandparent, you can't go back in and redo, but boy, what you've poured into your kids. That's good. You really are excited about. So these roles are temporary and they change. Please God in the moment, in the role that you're in right now. You know, what's really awesome about what you just said too, is we have kids that are watching, and this is actually, I'm going to give this as a challenge for the kids that are sitting there. This is an opportunity for you to hear some great information that can really profoundly impact you and your relationship with your parents. It's interesting that you said all rules are temporary, and I'm going to just going to poke at that on one part. There's one rule that isn't temporary, and it's the one that we learned in the first three chapters of Ephesians. And it's this, we learned in the first chapter of Ephesians, that God has chosen us and he's adopted us and we become his children. And the one role that doesn't change is I am a child of God. I am sealed until the day of redemption. Absolutely. But one thing we've realized in all of these roles, and this came up back when we talked about three weeks ago in relationship to the government and, and to all of that, and then also in husbands and wives and all of them, submission plays a role. Parents, kids, husbands, wives, government. Submission is a part of this. Explain that again. What do, what do you see as submission? I think this is a countercultural place we wrestle because in American thinking, submission is often losing. And, and yet in God's understanding of it, God uses submission. We are often over people, supervising, training, whatever that looks like. And we are also going to be under somebody's leadership. And so trusting God enough to be humbly responsive to the authorities he's allowed in my life. And that training ground begins when you're a kid. Right. And so when we get, we're getting started, we want you to really focus in. Those of you who are kids, listen carefully because we're going to start with helping you have a better relationship with your parents. But you asked a question earlier this week that I thought was profound. And this is really relating to parents and how they see their relationship to their kids. Do you remember the question that you asked? Yeah. What, what's more important now or later? What, what's more important, just getting through the moment or getting my kid to behave or getting through a, a shopping experience without you know, losing my mind um, or what really the impact is in those kids' lives later. Let me, so 
let me tell you how that feels. When you ask the question, like it makes me want to push you off your stool a little bit <laughs> because you're saying that in this beautiful, ide idealistically, I, I'm with you that later is better. As a parent in the middle of it, now is what feels so pressing. Yeah. Because now is when we are homeschooling. Now is the time when there's these problems. Now I'm dealing with it. And it's so easy to see the six-year-old and think I'm dealing with the six-year-old and forget that that's the now. But the goal is that we're not working with six-year-olds. We're raising 36-year-olds. So you're raising a seven-year-old and 11-year-old in your home, right? No, I have a seven-year-old and I have an 11-year-old. I'm raising a 41-year-old and I'm raising a 49-year-old and I'm raising a 60-year-old and I'm raising a parent and I'm raising a grandparent. But that's really, really hard to remember yeah. when the pressing feelings. And I, I feel like, I, just parents for a second, are you feeling this too? The pressure that's on us at a higher level. Parenting is harder during this COVID crisis. These last 10 weeks have been more difficult. Yeah. They're just, it's just harder. I, I acknowledge that the people that are at home trying to work, you know, maybe they're still, they're doing some in person, some they're working over the internet and they're trying to, help their kids with homework and assign their kids homework and maybe deal with preschoolers as well. And it's been really tough. Right. But if we can really buy into this later, this might be the perfect opportunity to help our children become 40 year olds. And if we can have that vision that we're growing, we're growing future leaders, we're growing them towards that. It may radically change our perspective on the now. So as we get started, we're going to go right to verse one. So we're going to begin with you kids. So all of you kids that are sitting there uh, listening to this, I want you to really dial in with me. I know some of you are doing some coloring. I want you to set the coloring aside, and I want you to connect with us for a second. So we're going to read two Bible verses, and I want you to look. It's going to tell you to do a couple things. So Paul's going to read this. I want you to look for the words that tell you what your role is. You ready, Paul? Yeah. So Ephesians 6, 1 and 2. Children. That's you. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with the promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. So there were two things that you were told. Let's go over them real quickly. <laughs> what were they, Paul? Point to it. Obey. And point to the next one. Honor. Honor. These are the two things we want to dial in with you. How do you obey and how do you show honor? And who are the people that they both honor and who do the people they, they obey, Paul? They are to honor their parents mm -hmm. and they're to obey their parents. Okay. So this means this is about the relationship that you as kids have with your parents. Okay, kids, listen to me. Raise your hand if you want a better relationship with your mom and dad. Right. Of course you do. Do you want to have more fights with your mom and dad? No, if you do, we'll pray for you after the service, okay? <laughs> so let's focus in first on the idea of obey. So when, you come, when it comes to obey, Paul, what advice would you give to the kids just on their perspective of what they need to lock into here? Well, when I had kids that were in the home, we used to just say, we want you to obey two ways, quickly, cheerfully. And, and in the Irwin home, we have something very similar. We say we obey right away, all the way. You know why? <laughs> because I'm not very thorough. It's easy to not be thorough. In fact, I was thinking about this. This is something that I'm actually learning right now myself, especially that all the way, to put it all the way away. So quickly and cheerfully, which is the attitude and this timing, mine is more about the right away timing and then the, or the follow through completion all the way. Yeah, completion yeah. of it. Right. You know, one of the things that you had said to me earlier this week was, this is practice for something. Yeah. Where is practicing? So kids, when you're learning to obey and mom says, I need you to put these four things in these four areas and you're making a decision on what you're going to do, you're practicing for something. What is that? You're learning to obey God. That that's the first place where you have a chance to say, I got to obey usually is doing something I wasn't going to do anyway. And it, it means that I'm going to learn to obey my parents because I see that God is working through them. And ultimately it helps me obey God. And, and honestly, as a parent, when I would say, obey quickly and cheerfully, I, I would envision that's probably exactly what God's saying to me. <laughs> Here's how I want you to obey quickly and cheerfully. And how am I right away? And what do I need to work on? All the All way. The way. Shh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but now there's a problem here, Paul. One of the things that you also said, and then we heard some great wisdom from some of the other pastors on, and kids, you need to listen carefully to this because there are moments 
where there's a problem with obeying parents. And I'm going to say something. You have to listen to all of this. Paul, when are the times when it is okay to not obey your parents? Listen all the way. Yeah, so, so we had some encouragement to not think of every home as ideal and wonderful. And the truth is, in our broken world, there are some homes where some awful things happen. And here's the way. You obey your parents until your parents are asking you to do something that God says not to. So if it's sin, if it's wrong, there is a place for you to say, no, I'm not going to do that. And maybe talk to a teacher or a friend or a pastor, because there are some homes where parents are using this to make their kids do things that are not right. So that's a great caution. If you're in a home where you're doing, they're, they're asking you to do the things that are not right. Then there's a place for you to say, I, I can't obey this, which is honestly our response also to the government. We obey until they're asking us to do something that is biblically wrong. So on a really simple level, a great example of this, if your parents ask you to lie, what does the Bible say about lying? No, we are to tell the truth. Yep. Okay. So we want you to understand that component. Uh, let's move on and say, go to the next one. Remember it was obey. And now kids, what was number two? Honor. Very good. So... Talk to me about honor. So obeying is a temporary process. While you are in their home, while you are under age, your parents are taking care of you, providing for you. You're to be obedient to them. Right. Then the rest of your life, you are to honor. You don't obey the whole life. You obey and honor mm -hmm. as a kid, but you honor your parents for your whole life. And we've had some interesting discussions in our life group about how to honor your parents. And you don't necessarily honor parents in exactly the same way. Well, we brought this up last week when we talked about the circles in marriage. But what I'm hearing you're saying is that how you honor mom may be different than how you honor dad. Explain yeah. that a little bit more. Well, there's some things that are always honoring, like listening, like, like being encouraging, saying positive things. But, but particularly, usually there are some specifics that you can say, I, I need to honor my dad in this way. And in my own life, I'm a lot more like my mom. So it was easy to honor her and to, to say, I want to be like that. My dad was different than I am. And so I, I took me longer to learn how to say, wow, look at the gifts that my dad has given me. And how can I honor him for those gifts? Didn't that happen? Actually, if you talked about honor, remember kids, honor is all the way through life. Didn't you learn some of that after you were out of the home? I did. I did. In fact, it was a, a moment where I was writing a Father's Day card to my dad and I was going over in my own life, all of the incredible gifts that my dad has given me. And I had to say, thank you. And, and I, I think it meant a lot to him, but it meant a lot to me too. It changed my perspective just to one of gratefulness instead of maybe being critical. I re so I remember that time frame and you sharing it with me and the impact that it had. I saw in you something transformed because listen to this kids as an adult, pastor Paul learned to honor his kids or his kids, his dad, his dad. He was the, the adult that was honoring his father um, at that stage. So what I'm hearing you saying is kids learn this. How does mom need to be honored? Now think about that. Now, how does dad need to be honored? If you can learn that now, it will be so powerful because there's a special promise that comes with this. It says, if you learn to honor your father and mother, it will go well with you. That mean you make a lot of money? No, and I think this is so key because when we say that it would go well with you, here's the mindset. If I honor my father, so I'm going to say, dad... This is, I'm going to honor you. That, that From then on, guaranteed, I will just make more and more money. Things will go really well that way. I don't think that's what it means. In fact, I think here's how it really plays out. When I learn to honor my father, it means I learn to honor everyone else. And you want to, you want to look at a good life? It's whenever you have the ability to honor those around you. The great gift, kids, that you're going to get in this, if you learn to honor mom and dad... This is where you'll play it out. You will learn to honor your boss well when you have a job. You'll learn to honor your coach well and your teacher well. That's what going well means. I don't think it's really about money. And I'll, I'll give you an example. And, and parents, I want you to hear this too. If you think that the mindset is, if my kids will just honor me, it will go well with them. I had the one moment when that looked true. So um, if you've ever been um, a, a, a parent of a four-year-old, raise your hand if you've ever been a parent of a four-year-old. Do you remember walking into a grocery store with a four-year-old? Okay, so we have the setting, right? So this was very rare. Anna was a four-year-old. 
And this only happened once. But Anna was not honoring mom and dad in the grocery store. This was Sherm's. And so we scooped her up and said, mm, that doesn't work. This, that's, this, is, this is really sad. And so we headed out. We walked out the front door. We were walking to the car. And of course, when you're in trouble, there's no talking. But she goes, uh, Dad? And I said, Anna, you're not talking right now. And she said, Dad? Anna had dishonored her mother and father and been removed from Sherm's. And while walking from the door of Sherm's to our car, a bird pooped on her. <laughs> Immediate consequences. <laughs> right. This is like exact. The Bible's true. Honor your father. <laughs> Think about this. Anna has gone in and out of Sherm's hundreds of times. No bird had ever pooped on her. But listen to this. Think of how many times you dishonored your mother and father. Where was the bird pooping on you? <laughs> This is not a reality, and this is why I think it's so important. If you think every time you honor, you get a reward, it's not exactly true. And that's why I think it's a deeper issue that when kids, when you learn to honor mom and dad, you're learning how to honor others, and it's a deeper and more, more profound thing. So is eye rolling ever honoring? Yeah, I, I think this is a really good point, and I, I think everyone needs to hear this, especially as you're getting a little bit older. If you're hitting into that teen, teen year, uh, there's two actions that I think are really dangerous. Rolling your eyes, and then <laughs> Those aren't actually words, but they communicate a lot. And I've never, ever seen a father or mother feel honored. I want you to listen to me. When they say something, and your response is rolling your eyes or huffing, Yeah, it, it's not helpful. For, for you who parents who are parenting right now, Part of how we move from just talking about what the kids are to do is to understand that you're modeling honor for them. Ooh. The way that you talk about your parents is going to be reflected in how they talk about you. The, the way that you talk about the governor, the way that you talk about people who are in authority over hang you. Hang on, hang on, hang on. I think there's some um, conviction that was happening. I think you need to repeat that. How you talk about who? The governor, the president, the authorities, the commissioners, that we are by the way that we respond to the authorities over us, we are modeling for them how we really think they ought to respond to us. So I think it's very dangerous to say, do as I do or do as I say, but not as I do. Do as I do, do as I say, do it right. You know, in, in case of that, then this also means when sports resume, parents, how you respond to the referee, how you respond to the umpire, how you talk to the coach, you are training them how to do it. And I want to give another um, aspect on this because we're, we're going to shift a little bit to the parents now. Um, I think there's a real danger. When parents see, verse 1, children, obey your parents, for this is right in the Lord. When they see that and they think that is the main focus of parenting, it is a key component, but that's really, those two verses are about the kid. That's the kid's choice. And kids, it, obeying is a choice. Honor is a choice. That is totally a reality. That is a choice that you make. And when parents say, this is how I'm going to parent, if the goal of parenting is verse one, to get them to obey, you will probably bend towards behavior modification and not growth. Okay? And getting kids to do exactly what you say. Parents, raise your hand if you would love it if your kids from zero to 18 just did everything you say. <laughs> Sounds easy. <laughs> Here's the problem. That's often not how they grow and learn. Because imagine if they put them in with a boss that does something illegal and they just do what everyone says. No. This is not about compliance. It's about something much deeper. So we're going to transition to verse number four, where we're going to look at the relationship of fathers and mothers and talk about how we can parent well. Yeah. So Paul, why don't you go ahead and read this? So it says specifically fathers. Um, some translations, it's parents. I think clearly this is focused on parenting in general. Um, let's, let's not forget, though, that dads, it's putting a particular responsibility on us. Um, sometimes it's easy for us to say, well, I'm working or I'm doing this and I'm out of the home and, and maybe mom's out of the home and she's working too. And, and, and I think we've both got to come together and say this is a team effort and we need to work together at the parenting. So fathers, parents, do not exasperate your children. So first of all, it's a do not. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. So as you said that, it does start with our prohibition, something that we're supposed to not do. This idea of exasperate, do you have a definition for us? Yeah, it's, it's the idea that 
in my exasper- in my dealing as a parent, I am causing them intense frustration or discouragement. So there are, there are lots of different ways in which parents can do that. Um, some parents do that because they are never satisfied with the accomplishment that their kids make. Um, yeah. the, kid, the kid gets a B and they're like, why didn't you get an A? Or he gets all district and why didn't you get all state? And, and really it's about the, the percentage of criticism versus the encouragement. Right. And, and it's easy for us to, to raise that level of expectation continually above their ability. And I think also it can be that when we switch our expectations all over the place, but probably the greatest area we exasperate and, and I think it's like rivets again in your genes where you say, here's what parents, you're going to have a tendency to do this is that when we get angry and we actually discipline our kids out of a frustration with how they're making us feel or how they're making me look. Right. And did you ever parent stronger when your kids <laughs> made errors at church? Oh yeah. Or in the store when everybody's watching, it's easy to overreact. That's a great caution for parents there to, to say, Whoa, be careful, because when you put that extra on, then you know what? you're training them right there. And what did you just train them in? Yeah, that in public, you can get angry because somebody's not doing what you want them to do. Exactly. I, the way I like to see this is anytime I bring unneeded emotion into the situation, I am exasperating. I am escalating the problem. If, the, if there has been a poor choice, every time we add more negative emotion, we are adding to the problem. <laughs> so... To respond to childishness by being childish does not help anything. (laughs) And there we have it. So this, this, you know what I was just, and I hadn't thought of this until we're talking about it right now. This idea of do not exasperate is in the now. Yeah. But the second part, the other two things that he's saying, those are trajectory issues that are pointing towards the future. Have you thought of that? In fact, he says instead. I didn't even catch that either. So Guys, right now, parents, here's what I need you to hear right now. This idea of do not exasperate. Can you lower the emotions in the room when there is a problem? When there's a discipline issue, if we can lower those emotions, that's a now issue, especially with in light of the homeschooling. And I know school's about to be out and I know a lot of you are gonna breathe more deeply with that. <laughs> but in the, in the light of all of this, can we lower the emotions in there? That's a now issue. And sometimes it's about taking a pause. It's like, Go to your room, go sit down. I need, to, I need to take a walk around the block so that I do this well. Right. The value of a pause will eliminate some of that. So number one we had on that is don't exasperate your kids. Um, you know what I would actually say? I was just thinking about this. And I know that a lot of kids are, are sitting watching with their parents. You know what I would challenge you as a parent to do? Simply every night at bed ask, hey, was I too sharp with you? Wow. Is there something that I've done where I have brought too much emotion? And that's a great, simple question. You can ask it of a four-year-old because a four-year-old knows when you're, yeah, 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 I have been. So number one is exasperate. Um, number two is how do we? <laughs> Don't exasperate. <laughs> oh, man. That's a lot harder. Okay. So the next one, we're looking at train and instruct. Yeah. What do you, explain to me a little bit of the instruct part. Again, I think that sometimes this is where diving into the words really helps us. So instruction is about understanding. It's about what do you, I want you to do? And how do you do it? And, and sometimes, honestly, parents, we're asking our kids to do things that we haven't, we haven't given them enough instruction about. But most of us, I would say, do that better. We tell our kids, here's how you make your bed, or here's what I want you to do for, you know, when you're done with the, in the shower or whatever. We, we do give them instruction, but I think often we're missing the training part. So instruction is info. Yeah. Training is practice is what I'm hearing you're saying. Yeah. Definitely. So I, I want to come back to this idea that I am not raising a seven and 11 year old. I'm raising two adults because the mindset will change drastically. And I want to give you a scenario here. Okay. So we're talking about one of your children and they are old enough to read a clock. So let's just say the, the kid is seven or eight years old. It's noon. And this is what you say to them. You have an option. You have chores to do. If you have them done by three tonight, we will be watching a movie and having ice cream. Okay. So the scenario is there's three hours They understand what's expected. They know how to do it. This isn't a new chore. They know how to do it. And there's a time limit. Okay. And they're old enough to read a clock. So let me ask you, I want you to think about this at home. Don't answer too quickly. How many times should the parent remind the kid that three o'clock is coming? How many times? What's a a healthy amount? (laughs) My my wife used to occasionally go, 
tick, 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 just to remind him that the clock was running. <laughs> right. And in that, so, because here's what I want to lay out for you. The answer is it depends on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to raise an adult, what that means is you need to think about this. When they're 40 and they're at work and there's a report due, do you plan on being there a half hour before the report's due to say, now remember, Sammy, it's time to get that done. <laughs> He's 40. No. And in the same way, if it's 2.30 and there's a half hour for the chores to be done, training says, let them fail. Because here's what will happen. At 3 o'clock, the chores won't be done. Perfect. They missed the movie and they missed the ice cream. Now, here's the question. Are you okay with that? That's if, hard. <laughs> it may be hard. If you are okay with them actually living with the consequences of their actions, they learn. And the longer that we continue to walk in, in, in some ways, by reminding, we are stunting their growth. Because if you think of it this way, let their choices lead to the consequence, then, then this is what they'll learn. Choices are vital to my success, not mom and dad who come along and remind and remind and remind. So, so training is about helping them learn to make good choices. Now, I know you and you and Crystal and actually several people have helped with this love and logic training. And, and I think it's helped so many parents be able to understand what I'm supposed to do because that was a great scenario. I think sometimes we say things to our kids like, you should behave. It's like exactly what is that and what does that mean Stay and calm. when? And so you're talking about very clear instructions, very clear timeline, very clear, here's your choice A, here's your choice B. So that's, that's part of the instruction part of it. And then... The train, I think you made a great point. When you say the word behave, the kid doesn't know what that means. In the same way, hey, parents, you need to train your kid. Okay, yeah. get to it. Well, what, what does that mean? And we're going to walk through a little, um, a little form uh, that has been very, very, very helpful for us. Because remember, 40-year-olds make choices. Six-year-olds make choices. And the real key to maturity is what kind of choices do you make? So this is really helpful for us. So the first question in training, and we want you to know, this is not something from Ephesians 6. This is some wisdom that will help explain some of the training. But don't feel like we drew this from the text. But we want to walk this through with you. The first thing that we want to ask is, who sets the choice? And this is really critical. Because in some homes, the kid is doing it. That is a recipe for disaster. Parents, you are called to lead and to train. And if the choices are set by the kids, we have a problem. So the first thing you need to know is the parent sets the choices. But you have to understand this as well. You have to be okay with the choices you give. Okay? Do the chores. Don't do the chores. I don't care. But here's what happens when you do the chores. And here's what happens when you don't do the chores. It's a learning opportunity, but you have to be okay with them. And I've seen this before where the, the option is um, clean your room. If you clean the room, you get to watch the movie. The kid goes, I don't really want to watch the movie. So they don't clean their room. And the mom's mad. Well, why is the mom and dad mad? You gave the choice. You got to be okay with both. Which, which means you need a little practice in how to set up choices carefully. Think so through <laughs> your choices. Very, that's a really good point. Uh, the second question that we have here is who makes the choice? Well, when you're not okay with the choices, you know what sometimes happens? The parent, and play that scenario out. You have to have your room clean if you want to watch the movie, and the, it's not happening. Well, the mom's not okay, or the dad's not okay with the choice, comes in and says, the reason I keep saying mom is this is a scenario in my head that I've walked through with someone that had told me their story, and I realized, I keep saying that because she kept coming in and saying, no, do, 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 do. What she wanted to do is she wanted to come in and make the choice. Yeah. Well, that's not a training opportunity. That's the mom controlling the op that, that option. It happens just as much with dads. But the issue is, who has to make the choice? It has to be the kid. And I think that's scary for some parents. They're like, well, how can, I, how can I know they're going to make the right choice? And what I hear you saying is that actually consequences are a great training process. But sometimes we're afraid of that because it does cost the parents a little bit. It, there is a cost to it. This... When you start allowing this to happen, you're, you're giving up control. For instance, and this is a great love and logic idea, is um, we call it a just-in-case coat. But th these are your options. You can wear your coat or you can carry it. I'm okay with both of those options. Right. If they, if they want to be cold, what do I care? Versus I'm going to control you. You will put a coat on. So there was no choice. This is a, this is a really key um, opportunity. Uh, if you have been to love and logic, this is a drill sergeant parent if they don't let the kid make the choice. Uh, and then the final one is who pays for the choice? 
<laughs> and, and part of this is setting up good choices because sometimes parents do it so that it's really hard on them instead of it That's being good. hard on the kid. So let's just say a kid does not do their homework. The teacher holds them accountable. Have you ever heard of a parent going into the teacher to fight on behalf of the kid? Yeah. So what happened is there was a choice set by the teacher, a choice made by the child. And who's going to pay for the choice? Yeah. The teacher. <laughs> yeah, in fact, this is what we would call a helicopter parent. Nowadays, they are fully armed. They have semi-automatic weapons that are attached to the wing. I mean, they come in firing uh, because here's what happened. A choice was set. A choice was made. But who's going to pay the price? And this would be a helicopter parent. If you don't have the child, pay for it. Because it really has to be that. And I think this is an important moment to say um, that we've, we, we get very little training either in how to be a good marriage partner or how to be a good parent. Mm -hmm. And what we often do is number one, we just, we just imitate whatever our parents did. And if it wasn't terrible, sometimes that's your default setting. You just like, well, this is how you do it. And you just operate on automatic or you're really upset with how your parents did it. And so you're going to do it exactly the opposite. And that's part sometimes, of why we're sometimes dangerously too. Very much. Yeah. And, and I think that's why we're trying to say you need to come to the scripture. You need to, have, you need to have as much training as you can possibly get. You need to have godly wisdom from other people who've been through it. That's, that's actually one of the great benefits of being in a, in a church relationships because you've got people that are further down the road and they can say, boy, I wish I, if I had to do it over again, I would have done more of this. Because in the moment, watching the movie with two of your children and not the third one, can feel like it's hard. It's a, it's a difficult process. They're crying in the bedroom. And, and yet, yeah. if you're raising a 40-year-old, you realize the temporary discomfort is worth the, the, the long-term influence. You know, I was convicted of as we're sitting here. Um, so I have taught Love and Logic over 20 times. Crystal and I have sat together with, with couples and talked through what it means to be a parent. And this is just such a key component of it is the choice idea. And I'm realizing how few choices I've been giving lately. Oh. And for those of you who don't have a background in choices, I realize you're saying choices for what? Start with something simple. You can do things like, would you rather play on the trampoline or play on the slide? Those are very simple ones. And then you start thinking about how would I do this at dinner? Feel free to join us for dessert when you've eaten your dinner. Then you're giving those kinds of choices. So, um, but this is something, if you really focus on, it will really help in your training. Well, we've had a lot of great information that's been given today. And I know that some of you are thinking it feels a little bit like a fire hose and it's hard to take it all in. So I'm going to give you some advice. I would love it if you would find someone that you look at the way they're parenting and you want to be like them. And I want you to take them out for coffee. Now, you can't stay at the coffee shop because they're all closed. But find somewhere to sit down and have a conversation with a parent that you admire. Also, you can look for resources. There are a lot of great books on this um, that you can order on Amazon, or perhaps you'd like to go to our Right Now Media, and there are some parenting um, resources on there. But ultimately, I think the, the main place that we want you to come back to is the Bible. And if you're going to have one thing that you're going to pour into your kids, it comes from the Bible, because we're about discipling our kids, not just making sure that they do what we say. So we have a question that we want to challenge you with, that we'd love it if everyone here would spend some time having the dialogue together. Um, so here's what we have. We have a question, and the question is, what relationship needs more honor? So this has to do, parents, if you are saying, I want to be more honoring of the kids and the way I relate to them and discipline them, I need to be more honoring to my parents um, verbally in front of my kids and to my parents. I need to be more honoring maybe even to some other authorities. And then don't just say, mom, dad, that's the short answer. Then you, then you need to follow up and say, how am I going to honor them? What is the way that I need to work on giving honor? And I think it's so crucial that we set that desire to have a culture of honor in our homes. And I, and I hope that that's going to be something that comes out of this uh, series, out of this message. And that as we pray together, because parenting is hard, that God would give us the wisdom, the ability, the support, all that we need because it's a extremely important thing. So, so who's going to ask the question? I think it should be the youngest person in the room. Give them some honor here. And you look at whoever is the other people in the room and you say, who is it that you need to honor more? And let them share answer. How. Let them share how. All right, why don't we close in prayer? Okay. 
Lord Jesus, I am so grateful that you are pulling us into this. And I was just thinking how Paul started the sermon, how this is a great opportunity for parents to grow. And it's a great opportunity for children to grow. And I pray that that would happen. And I pray that you would grow us in our response. You would grow us, grow us in honor and how we honor each other. But more than anything, I pray that you would grow us in our relationship with you. Uh, thank you for the grace that you have poured into us. And I pray that the grace that we receive that we do not deserve that it would pour out in our home. I pray that we would be gracious with our kids and our kids would be gracious with us. I pray that husbands and wives would be gracious with each other, that siblings would be gracious with each other, that grace would echo out of the honor that's in our home. We love you, Lord, and in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I love you. Have a great discussion. We're so glad that you're joining us by video. And uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here and you're... Uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person. And I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me. Or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging. And we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.